Thank you all for being here. I, uh, as I was looking at those text responses, <clears throat> I was thinking back over my career, starting when I trained in psychiatry through being a dean, a medical center CEO, and I was always struck by the fact that I would meet colleagues in distress, students, residents, faculty, uh, and whether they were burned out or actually in a major depression or even suicidal, they always seemed uh, to be suffering from this profound sense of isolation and loneliness. And I think uh, that really is why we have as our first objective today focusing in on the topic of work in the loneliness epidemic. We're really privileged uh, to have two uh, world-class participants in this session. First of all, Rear Ad Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy, uh, our 19th Surgeon General, who now is continuing uh, his varied enterprises as an internist and entrepreneur. And Dr. Marissa King, who's a professor uh, of uh, organizational uh, behavior at the Yale School of Management. So I'd like to invite them to come up and join me on the stage for what we hope will be a conversation first among us and then with you. I don't, I don't know if we have nameplates, but uh, perhaps you can tell Marissa from <laughs> so when we had talked about this session uh, on the phone, we were planning on having a sort of uh, armchair conversation, fireside chat. So I want you to imagine us sitting in luxurious armchairs, <coughs> fire crackling in front of us. Uh, and I also want you to be thinking about uh, comments you might want to make uh, about this topic because we want to leave uh, a good piece of time for discussion both for those of you here uh, in the room and also those online virtually can pose questions to us. But uh, Dr. Murdy, maybe you could start. So, um, you know, my memory of, of your tenure as uh, Surgeon General, I was struck by the work you did really really helping the country understand the opioid epidemic. Uh, certainly the, uh, the first Surgeon General's report you issued on uh, alcohol, drugs, and health. How is it that focusing on those issues brought you to this topic of loneliness? Well, that's a great question. And let me just say uh, what a privilege it is to be here talking about this subject of clinician well-being and, and loneliness. You know, I think 10 years ago it would have been hard to imagine us uh, sitting in this auditorium having this conversation. Uh, it would have been hard to imagine that people in this room actually stepping up and putting their time and their money and their energy into addressing a topic like this. But I think the fact that you are here, the fact that we are talking about this in this hall in particular, I think just tells us how far we have come as a profession, even as we realize how much farther we have to go. When I began my tenure as Surgeon General, I did not think that I would be talking or thinking about loneliness. I didn't even more broadly think that the subject of emotional well-being would be uh, a key area of focus for me. But I really came to that because I was educated by the people I met in communities all across the country. I began my tenure actually doing a, a, uh, you know, a listening tour and just asking people a simple question, which is how, how can I help? And it was the answers to that question, the, that simple question that actually drove much of what I focused on, including opioids and addiction more broadly. But what I came to see, actually, when I spoke to people who were struggling with addiction and their families, was that loneliness was often part of their story. They may not have said it explicitly. They may not have come out and said, I'm feeling lonely. But it became very apparent in the conversations with them. And so then I started exploring this more broadly. And when I did, I started finding that loneliness was affecting everyone, that it was healthcare professionals, that it was uh, parents you know, who were struggling with loneliness, that it was uh, people who were struggling with addiction and chronic illness, that it was people really across the board. But what was really striking to me, and you know, apropos to the quote that uh, Charlie put up there, is that we were all, so many of us were struggling with loneliness, but we were struggling in our own silos and in silence and not recognizing that we were, in fact, not alone in our loneliness. And I think some of that has to do with this uh, unfortunate stigma around admitting that you're lonely, which is a very cultural I think, phenomenon. 
you know, my interest in this also was spurred by my own personal experience of dealing with loneliness throughout my life. And I first remember it as a child in elementary school feeling uh, lonely. You know, I, I think back on it now and I realize that the loneliest place in school is the cafeteria. Because as, it, as contradictory as that sounds, as counterintuitive as it is, you think of the cafeteria as a place we all come together and we're dying to get a break from classes in school. But for many children, it's a stressful place. You're wondering, who do I sit with? What if I'm alone? What does that say about me? And as a child, I, despite the years of experiencing loneliness, I never told my parents about it. In fact, to this day, I've never told them about it. I do a lot of interviews on this on the radio and on TV, and I'm like, if they hear one of those interviews, maybe they'll, like, <laughs> they'll worry and they'll ask me what's going on and why I didn't tell them. But, but the reason I didn't tell them back then, uh, the reason I didn't tell them now is I don't want them to worry, but back then, back then I was ashamed. You know, I felt that to say that I'm not lonely meant it was like saying that I was, wasn't being worthy, uh, that I wasn't worthy of being loved. And who wants to admit that to yourself, much less to other people? So we don't talk about loneliness because it, it feels uh, like a statement about ourselves. It feels like evidence of a, of a human flaw. Uh, and, but the irony is that we're, a lot of us are experiencing it. And one of the most common things that happens to me after I, I do talks is that people often come up to me and, and in hushed tones say, you know, I'm so glad that you talked about loneliness. I've been feeling that way and I'm not quite sure what to do about it. And I was doing a, a radio program with Iowa Public Radio just a, a few months ago. Uh, a, a man called in in his 40s. He said, my best friend died a few years ago and I've been feeling profoundly lonely ever since. But as a guy, I feel like I can't say that. I'm supposed to be strong and independent. That's what masculinity is about. What am I supposed to do? A young, uh, a woman called in at this same show and she said, you know, my daughter just came back from her first semester in college and she said, mom, I'm with kids all the time, you know, with other students on campus and we're texting each other, we're messaging each other, we see each other in class and in the cafeteria, but Nobody ever asks me anything about me. They don't understand who I am. I'm surrounded by people, but I feel so alone. And this mother was in tears when she was saying, I sent my daughter to college thinking she'd be part of a community. And now she's struggling with loneliness. And finally, with our own colleagues. You know, I have realized over time that I was not alone during those moments where I felt lonely in medicine. Uh, those long, you know, call nights, those uh, minutes before morning report where you're supposed to present something and you're not sure how it will be taken or whether it will turn into an M&M or not. Uh, these these you know, moments throughout our, our career in medicine where we wonder if we're doing the right thing, where we wonder if what we have uh, you know, in terms of our gifts for caring for patients really matters. Uh, this, one of the women who I trained with is an extraordinary uh, doctor. She, um, <clears throat> I remember one day in intern year, she came to Dorna. We had a small group meeting every Thursday morning where we would get together and we would talk about you know, how we were feeling about medicine. This was like a small group of four of us. And she came and she threw her sign-out papers on the table and she said, I'm just so upset right now. I just, I just, I'm not sure if I can make it. And we said, well, what's wrong? Like, well, why are you frustrated about, you know, about residency, what's happening? And she said, I feel like the only skill, she's like, I, I feel like I go to morning report and I feel like my differential aren't as long as everyone else. I feel like I can't cite the same number of papers or the depth of, uh, of papers that other people cite on rounds. So the only thing that I can do, the only thing, is I can sit down with patients and make them feel better. <laughs> and, you know, I was, uh, I was giving a talk at the Brigham uh, just a few weeks ago, and she was actually in the audience. And, and, and I, I, I said, you know, I hope you don't mind that I've been sharing your story all across the country. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that that hasn't fully changed. Like, what do we value, like, in our profession? Uh, you can see that not in what we put in our mission statements. You can see that in who we choose to promote based on what criteria. You can see that in what we tend to hold up you know, and, and glorify in morning report or in noon conferences and the kind of folks that we tend, tend to accomplishments that we tend to recognize. Uh, not that many people get recognized for their compassion and for their kindness. Uh, and, but I do think that the most important traits and, and qualities that we need as clinicians are the ones that we had long before we came to medical school. Our ability to listen, our willingness to be compassionate towards others, uh, our willingness to bring love into our practice of medicine. Uh, but unless those values are not just included in our mission <laughs> statements but reflected in how we operate and what we cherish and what we value and what we promote, the message we will continue to send uh, to 
clinicians is that that doesn't matter as much. And to the extent that that is a core part of who we are as people, we're telling people that they don't matter as much. And so that, these are all the reasons why loneliness came on my radar uh, and why I began to realize that it is our connections with each other that are the fabric that make up our society. Our connections with each other are the foundation on which we build everything else. And if those connections are weak, then not only will we have a difficult time building a fulfilled, resilient workforce to practice medicine, but we'll also have a difficult time creating schools where our children can learn, where they can feel safe and, and welcome. We'll have a hard time with productivity in the workplace. We'll have a difficult time getting people in our country to come together and to address difficult issues uh, because they will always be in a state of chronic stress. So this is why I think rebuilding our connections with each other is one of the most important issues that we have to deal with as a country and as a global society right now. It's, being, it's manifest as loneliness at rates that are extraordinarily alarming. Uh, and with consequences for health and otherwise that are also alarming. But the good news about loneliness is I think unlike treating pneumonia, unlike treating heart failure, all of us in society have the power to address loneliness. All we need is compassion and the courage to bring that compassion to our interactions with the people around us. It, it's interesting that you're... Um that listening tour and those conversations about opioid addiction open the door to lo loneliness. Uh, so Dr. King, you know, one of the great things about the collaborative is I think we've acknowledged that we can learn a lot from disciplines outside health and medicine, nursing and the like. Uh, you're a sociologist. You're a network scientist and, and by definition, uh, I guess most of us would imagine your focus would be on groups, but here you've become uh, nationally recognized as an expert on loneliness. How, how did that happen for you? Like Dr. Murthy, part of the journey was also personal. Um, so when I transitioned into being an assistant professor, it was a huge shock for me to have to be able to be in front of people. I was sort of used to being an academic researcher, and all of a sudden I had to be in front of people. Um, and I was given the advice of, that I think oftentimes physicians are often given, which is sort of take on a role and act like someone else. And the more I did that, the more isolated I became from myself and the harder time I had functioning. So by the time I was um, in my third year of professorship, I was, I was having to take beta blockers all the time. I had such a high level of social anxiety um, that I basically couldn't function. Until one day sort of, I <coughs> completely broke down. Um, and I didn't feel, I feel like as, at that point that I had support in the workplace or I had support at my home and I was trying to be someone I wasn't. Um, and the irony, like oftentimes it's true, right? We study things that we don't understand. Um, and so I was studying social interaction but I couldn't quite do it myself. Um, <laughs> go figure. Uh, and so my personal journey and experience with loneliness made me aware of it, and it was sincerely on my radar. But my understanding of what this meant for the medical profession um, really came about when I was actually working on a project trying to improve quality of care. So with the research team, we entered um, a federally qualified health system with the idea of we're here to try to improve social interaction. And that's really at the core of my work is trying to understand how to improve social interaction to make people happier, healthier, and organizations more productive. And so that's what we were trying to do in this healthcare system. And we were doing it with wearable sensors. So we had small sensors on people about the size of your phone and we could track the interactions that they were having on a second by second basis with each other. We could see how much they were <coughs> listening to each other, how active they were. And when we looked at the data, we were really surprised to find that the physicians actually who were having the largest number of interactions were the most dissatisfied with their job and at highest risk of turnover and burnout. And so what this started to highlight is that the problem really isn't how many people you're interacting with. I was interacting with lots of people on a daily basis in my work, but there was no depth or quality to, to those social interactions. And so in terms of thinking about loneliness and burnout, it really is 
critical, I think, to improve the quality of interactions, to allow people to be themselves, to feel heard, to be recognized in their day-to-day -day work in order to improve both healthcare delivery and well-being for individual physicians and patients, but also to help guard against burnout. Uh, Dr. Zhao cited some of the statistics we have uh, about the prevalence of burnout, depression, suicidal thoughts among health professionals. Is there an epidemiology of loneliness? What do we know? What proportion of our population is affected at this point? So the numbers vary, but it, sort of a rule of thumb is that one in five adults ex are lonely. If you look at data on physicians, there's not great data on physicians, but it seems like rates are a little bit higher. So one in three physicians will report having experienced um, a feeling of loneliness just even in the past week. So the prevalence is quite high. If we think about what we know about some of the causes, the causes are really varied. So you can think about everything from what's happening at a societal level. So there's increased mobility um, within jobs. People are moving more often. There's less support at the family level. There's an increased dependence on technology and reliance on technology. So there's a lot of broad level social factors that seem to be at play. Um, but the fact of the matter is also that we just don't spend that much time communicating and connecting with one another. The average American spends less than 40 minutes a day in any form of social interaction, and that's decreased precipitously over the past decade. That's declined by about 15%. So we're simply just not engaging with one another. Dr. Murthy, you, your story of the resident and her feeling isolated and uh, maybe having a bit of imposter syndrome even. Uh, in the collaborative, a lot of people have mentioned the loss of the doctor's lounge. <laughs> that historically in a hospital there was the physician lounge where, where you come together with your colleagues, um, talk about cases, talk about your lives, uh, and bond. Uh, what do you think uh, might be the opportunities to recre recreate that in the system we have now? Uh, there is no doctor's lounge per se. Um, everybody is terribly busy. As you've thought about the problem in healthcare settings, do you see tools, uh, approaches that might be used to restore, I don't know if I'm using the right term, but social cohesion? I think that's a great question. And um, one thing I think that is important to, for us to put on the table is that loneliness is not an entirely new issue, like in medicine. People have been experiencing loneliness for generations within medicine. It may be more visible now. It may, in fact, be worse now. Uh, but this isn't a, a problem that has cropped up overnight. And I think that to, to Dr. King's point, you know, I think um, one of the things we have to think about is the quality of the interactions between people. And this is especially important with the time factor that uh, Dr. Kirch mentioned. So you know, everyone is busy and has too much to do. And so if we tell people, hey, we want get to get everyone together in the hospital for a happy hour or for a weekend picnic, uh, that's going to be met with some groans from people who say, well, that's time away from my family. That's time away from writing my notes. I'm going to have to come back later and do them. And gosh, you're making my life actually harder despite your good intentions. Uh, and so I was actually dealing with this challenge when I was uh, in office, when I was a Surgeon General, and thinking about, on a smaller level, my team, recognizing that we had a lot of work to do. We were mission-oriented folks. We uh, had a short period of time to accomplish it. But we also needed to be able to create a work environment where people felt connected to each other, where they didn't feel lonely. Uh, and so we actually did try some of the get-together on weekend type things. That was hard. That was hard for people. And instead, we shifted something else, uh, which I've written a bit about called our inside scoop model, which was uh, a simple exercise that we would do, which took five minutes once a week. And everyone has five minutes in a week. And if you don't have five minutes in a week, that's a really big problem, right? That's like, uh, but what we did is, in our weekly meeting, we would have one person to have that five-minute slot to just share pictures with the group, pictures about some part of their life that was not related to work. It could be about their career before they came to the office. It could be about the, their family. It could be about their aspirations for what they wanted to do you know, like later in life. It could be about anything they wanted to. But I will tell you that in those five minutes, we developed such a deeper and better 
understanding of the people that, we, that worked with us. We developed a greater affection for them as we came to understand who they were, not just what they could do. Uh, and this, when I think about medicine, like this is one of the things that we have to do in terms of creating cohesion and connection in medical communities, is we have to help uh, create spaces and environments and opportunities for clinicians to know each other on that level. We walk around, so many of us, with masks on, masks that display what we think we should be, what we think society wants us to be, what we think the profession tells us we should be, whether that's an an incredible intellectual or a highly published author or somebody who can list you know, the entire differential for any uh, given chief complaint. But we're more than what we can do. And part of the challenge is that we live in a society that defines your worth by what you do, not by who you are. And as a result of that, being compassionate, being kind, being a good listener, uh, being somebody who cares deeply for your friends and colleagues and is willing to go out on a limb and stay extra uh, time or, you know, to help them or put in extra effort to make sure they're okay, that doesn't really get valued as much as whether we're publishing a first author paper in the New England Journal of Medicine or whether we are leading, uh, you know, committees or a part of august institutions. And so that piece we have to shift, and I think part of how we shift it is by creating these simple, short opportunities for people to get to know each other on a truly authentic level. But the second thing I think we have to do culturally in medicine is we actually have to make vulnerability uh, and imperfection okay, right? And we, again, this is about more than putting it in your, in your mission statement, but I think this is where leadership really has to model uh, that kind of behavior. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, as leaders that everyone has to, you know, share all of your problems, you know, at, at every, every meeting. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's important for people in an institution to see that, that their leaders uh, not only that they're not perfect, but that they are open about their imperfections, uh, that they are, are vulnerable at times, uh, that they are able to see that that is okay in the folks who work in their institution as well. Uh, so I think that that uh, cultural piece uh, is exceedingly important here. And the, the last thing I would say, just as, as a tool to help address loneliness, is to think about the connections that people have outside of work. One of the greatest challenges, I think, that leads to loneliness is that when people get engaged in a job or in a profession like medicine, it will often lead to their sources of connection outside of work being cut off or minimized over time. Uh, we see this, like many of us who have been through residency training can automatically re re probably remember, uh, you know, people who went through their training process and ended up breaking up with their girlfriends or boyfriends or getting divorced or going through experiences that were very difficult, feeling lonely and depressed because they didn't have time to connect with their family. Um, or with their friends, but that happens even after training. And one of the things that um, we have to think about is how do we protect that time, like outside of work, for people to really connect with their family and friends? We can't control what people do in that free time. We can't control whether or not they spend quality time with their family versus whether they're on Netflix for like four hours a night, right? That's, that's a separate issue and another a set of issues to deal with on an individual level. But to, to think about how to create, even to create the opportunity for people to engage requires us to create boundaries around work. That, that's an interesting point, though. Um, Dr. King, I remember um, being so impressed by uh, the political scientist Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, uh, where he talks about the erosion of things that used to bring us together, uh, coming together in church or the parent-teacher association, or at the bowling league. Uh, and he, what he implied is that those opportunities for social cohesion have, have broken down culture-wide so that there's even less opportunity for the clinician to have that place outside of healthcare. Uh, do you see opportunities or things that we need to pay attention to in society writ large, culture writ large, to create, recreate that greater social cohesion? Or are we just in a period where we're uh, in the wilderness looking for those new institutions that will pull us together? Dr. Murthy started to speak to this a little bit, and I really, community begins with who's around you. So if we think about how do we build 
more resilient connections or more community, it has to start in the places that we already interact. So with sort of the decline of associations, more associations, so having a bowling league at the hospital is probably not going to fix problems, but we need to figure out how to, without taking time, improve the quality of the interactions that are already happening within the teams, within teams, within families, within our communities. And we know, for instance, that high quality interactions, so when people are embedded in teams that have um, really high quality interactions, the individuals themselves are more, re more resilient. There is a higher level of cognitive functioning. The teams themselves tend to function better. They're more um, readily able to innovate. Um, and within medical teams, this has also been studied widely. So within medical teams where there's high quality interactions, what you'll see is that um, post-operative pain is lower, length of stay is lower, um, and overall perceptions of quality of care are better. So then the question becomes, well, how do we get higher quality interactions? Not necessarily, how do we get more interactions? Um, and I, I think that Dr. Murthy spoke to some examples that we know also from the literature that work really well to promote high quality interactions. So I love the story about your team um, because it really highlights the importance, for instance, of self-disclosure, of allowing different parts of ourselves to be made available, whether or not that, that's within the healthcare team itself or within physician and patient interaction. So self-disclosure is one of these very important levers. Um, listening, as you've mentioned, is another one. In trainings, when we teach, um, work with physicians in our clinical teams, not so much on patient-physician interaction, but on physician-physician interactions. There's a very small interventions, maybe that take four or five minutes, where you simply give some guidance about how you effectively listen to someone. And recently I was doing this training with a team from a hospital, and within two minutes of simply responding to the question, how are you, how are you feeling today? With, with a little bit of listening training, it's common to see people just start to cry because they've not had the experience of being listened to for so long, um, truly listened to. And oftentimes I feel like in interactions, people just need to be seen and heard and not necessarily, for instance, be given advice or um, given a Me Too story. And these type of simple interventions, whether that's sort of self-disclosure, listening, engaging in perspective taking, so oftentimes it's hard to say to someone, you need to be more empathetic or you need to be more compassionate. But very small exercises in allowing people to understand how can I understand what it's like to be you today, that that really improves the quality of interaction that people are having in their sense of social connection. And like Dr. Murthy says, it doesn't take more time. So you're not increasing the burden, you're just trying to build a stronger sense of connection through these micro level interactions which have huge benefits at the individual level but also um, for the pa for patients and delivery of care.